Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. This morning we want to look at the first six verses. Tonight we'll look at the entire chapter. But in the first six verses of Mark's Gospel here, chapter 6, we find Jesus returning the second time to Nazareth after his baptism. And he went out from there, that is the area of the Sea of Galilee, and he came again to his own country, that is Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own family and his own house. And he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about their villages teaching. As I said, this is the record of the second visit of Jesus to Nazareth after he began his public ministry, after his baptism. It's not to be confused with his first visit to Nazareth that followed immediately his experience of temptation in the wilderness by Satan. Luke tells us about that first visit to Nazareth, how that he came into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he read up, he stood up to read the scriptures and they handed him the scroll of Isaiah and he turned in the scroll to where it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And we remember how that Jesus, having read the scripture, then sat down and began to teach the people, saying, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. In other words, Jesus read the prophecy of the Messiah, and then he said, Basically, I am the Messiah. You are looking at the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, that was before he had begun his public ministry. That is before he had gone to the area of Capernaum and healed the sick and cleansed the lepers and raised the dead and cast out the unclean spirits. This was just the beginning. And Jesus then began to speak to them, according to Luke, showing them how that Oftentimes, the blessings of God came upon unlikely people as far as the Jew was concerned. How many lepers were there in Israel at the time that Naaman the Syrian was cleansed of his leprosy? How many widows in Israel when the prophet helped the woman of Sarepta? And as Jesus began to pour, uh, show God's grace upon all men, they were angry, you remember. They brought, they said, is this not the son of Joseph? And they brought him to the brow of the city or the, the, the cliff, and they were going to push him over. But Jesus passed through their midst. But their question, is not this the son of Joseph? 
He told them that a prophet was not without honor then except in his own country. Now, once again, he returns to Nazareth. But in the meantime, he had been doing these things that were prophesied of the Messiah. He had been healing the brokenhearted. He had been opening the eyes of the blind. He had been doing the works of the Messiah, preaching the gospel to the poor. And he came again with his disciples this time. Now, don't think of just the twelve. The disciples numbered into the hundreds. Twelve of them he called to be apostles. But when Jesus was traveling at this point, there was a great multitude of followers with him. Many disciples. And so he came back to Nazareth. The last time he was rejected. This time he is returning. The first time he was alone. Now there are multitudes with him who are followers of him and believing in him. And again on the Sabbath day, he went into their synagogue. And again he read the scriptures. And again he began to preach. Mark tells us that they were astonished at his teaching and they wondered how he learned all of these things what mighty wisdom was given to him and they also wondered at the mighty works that he had done now their question this time was is this not the carpenter the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon. Note the difference between this second visit and the first visit that is recorded by Luke. In Luke, they ask, is this not the son of Joseph? Here they are asking, is this not the son of Mary? The difference could indicate, number one, that Joseph had died in the meantime. So that having passed from the scene, they said, is this not the son of Mary? Or it could be that as the fame and notoriety of Jesus had grown, that there also had grown the rumor concerning his birth. The whisperings of how that Mary bore the child so quickly after the marriage to Joseph. Obviously was pregnant when they got married. And it could be that this was sort of a slur saying, is this not the son of Mary? When Jesus was disputing with the Pharisees, John tells us in the eighth chapter that they said to him in a very slurring way, we were not born of fornication. In other words, the suggestion that Jesus was an illegitimate child. Now, in reality, if indeed they were acknowledging that he was not the son of Joseph, but the son of Mary, you wonder why they didn't perhaps, with all of the things that he was doing, take the next step and say, could he be the Messiah of which it was prophesied, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Why is it that they only saw it in a negative way rather than in a positive fulfilling 
of the scriptures. Is this not the carpenter? They probably remembered him as a boy. They probably had brought to him their yokes or their plows for repair. Maybe they had purchased yokes that he had carved out and had made. Maybe they purchased tables or chairs from him. They knew him. They had, had an interchange with him in his earlier years. And it troubled them. Where did he get this understanding, this knowledge? Where did he get this power that he is manifesting? They marveled at his teaching. They marveled at his works. And they recognized that there was something extraordinary about him. And yet, they did not believe. So where they were marveling at him, he was marveling at them with all of the evidence still they did not believe and he marveled at their unbelief. Throughout the entire area of the Galilee, he was met with throngs of people. They would bring their sick from all over that they might be healed those that were infirmed they would crowd close to Jesus just to touch him there was a real desire of the people to be near Jesus to be close to touch and to be healed but here at Nazareth it was a different story they were sort of standoffish. They weren't bringing the multitudes of sick. They weren't bringing the blind and the lame. They just wondered, where did he get this wisdom? Where did he get this power? Why do you suppose their unbelief? Unbelief so great that Jesus marveled that they would not and did not believe. It came from the fact that they felt that they knew him. But they were mistaken. They did not know him. Oh, they possessed a certain amount of head knowledge. They knew that he had grown up there in Nazareth, that he had been a carpenter, they knew his brothers and his sisters and his mother. They had been close to him. They had had commerce with him. They may have, may have even touched him as a young man or a child. But there was much about Jesus that they did not know. They thought they knew him completely. They only knew him Partially, And their unbelief was thus based upon insufficient knowledge of Jesus. But I think today how many people there are whose opinions of Jesus are based upon insufficient knowledge. There are people who are very opposed to to Jesus, who really don't even know him, who have never really made an honest effort to know him. Their prejudice often comes just from what they have heard others say about Jesus. They have heard other people make disparaging remarks concerning Jesus and they have just picked up on the unbelief of others and they have taken a position of unbelief because they really don't know him nor have they endeavored to really understand him. 
But you know, the claims that Jesus made are so radical. And the consequences of not believing in him are so great. It would be wise for a person to examine all of the evidence personally before forming an opinion concerning Jesus Christ. Jesus said, He that believes upon me shall be saved. He that doesn't believe in me shall be damned. Now that's radical. But look at the consequences of unbelief. Jesus said a person would be damned. Eternal life or eternal damnation is at stake. With the stakes so high, you should make more than just a cursory examination of the facts, but you should study diligently to determine whether or not Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Or is he just a fraud, a liar, a deceiver, and thus you are justified in your unbelief? Jesus had challenged them to search the scriptures he said, in them you think you have eternal life, but they do testify of me. How can you know the truth about Jesus? Search the scriptures. Paul the apostle thought that he knew Jesus. He thought that he was a leader of a sect that was anti-Jewish and must be stamped out at all cost. Where did he develop this concept? No doubt from the sessions with the Pharisees. The teachings of the Pharisees. He had heard them express their opinions and their doubts. But one day Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus. He met Jesus and he came to know him personally, and it transformed his life. It turned him around. He was a changed man. And how many people there are who have had opinions against Jesus, but when they came to know Jesus, how things so radically changed in their lives. Because in knowing him, they became convinced that indeed he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. What do you know about Jesus? How much do you know about Jesus? Where did you get your information about Jesus? Have you read the Gospel of John prayerfully? Have you read it saying, now, Lord, if this is a true record, if you are really the Son of God, reveal yourself to me. Show me. Have you read it with an open heart or have you always had that prejudice in your mind against him? Where did the prejudice come from? A personal encounter? A personal experience, a personal examination of the facts? Or is it something that has been developed in your mind as the result of just listening and hearing others who were, for the most part, enemies of Jesus Christ? How can you be so foolish as to reject something that you don't know or understand at all? It's really a sign of ignorance to be so opinionated about something that you really know nothing at all about. And thus, 
even as Jesus marveled at their unbelief, I must say that I marvel at the unbelief of men today who have such strong opinions about Jesus without ever examining the facts. Now, the results of their unbelief was this, that he could do no mighty works there. What does that mean? Does it mean that their unbelief actually restricted his power to do miracles? I hardly think so. As we read in the psalm today concerning the children of Israel, that they limited the Holy One of Israel by their unbelief. What the psalmist is saying is that God was wanting to do much more for them. But their unbelief kept them from those things that God was wanting to do for them. God would have done much more for them. But their unbelief kept them from what God was wanting to do. It isn't a limitation of God's power. The limitation comes in their refusal to receive God's power. You remember when Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem and he cried, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and you stone those that are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. I would have done so much for you. I desired to do so much for you. I longed to do so much for you, but you would not. Rather than believing that their unbelief actually hindered the power of Jesus, I believe it just kept them away from Jesus. Because of their unbelief, they didn't bring the lame, the blind, the infirmed. And thus he did no mighty work there because they did not offer to him the opportunity to do so. I don't think that there was a reluctance on his part nor a lack of power on his part nor a lack of willingness. I don't think that he withheld it because he said, okay, I'll just teach you, you know. But I believe that it was just that their unbelief kept them from coming and receiving all that he desired to do for them. And that's the problem. You see, he wants to do so much for you today. But your unbelief keeps you from the work of God. Your unbelief keeps you from the love of Jesus Christ. Your unbelief keeps you from the salvation from sin that he offers to all. Your unbelief keeps you from the peace of Christ and from the love of Christ. And thus you go on in darkness you go on in sin. Your life is frustrated. And you feel all of the anxieties. And you go through all of the worries and the miseries of life. In unbelief. Now, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. To think that they would withhold his power from their needy friends and relatives just because of their unbelief. To think that they would reject what they saw. 
They wondered at his works. They, they marveled at his wisdom. They wondered where in the world did he get all of this? And yet, they did not believe. They were rejecting what they were actually seeing. Before us is so much evidence of the power of Jesus Christ. There is the witness of so many thousands of lives that have been radically changed. People who were hopeless alcoholics written off by the world, who are now whole, healed, productive citizens. They were once so lame, but now they are standing whole in our midst as a witness of the power of Jesus Christ. So many who were strung out on drugs, hopelessly strung out on drugs, now delivered, now serving the Lord. So many whose lives were so miserable, they were at the point of death, taking their own lives. There was nothing they could see worth living for. And now you see their lives so rich, so full, smiles on their faces as they're walking with the Lord in newness of life. And so much evidence. And of course, we have the history. We have the scriptures, the prophecies. And even as Jesus marveled at the unbelief that kept them from his love and from his work, so I marvel at the unbelief of people today. Because I see that it has no value but I see that it actually is a detriment and is keeping them from the wonderful things the Lord desires to do for them in these days. Oh, let us beware that our hearts not be filled with unbelief, that we would restrict what Jesus is wanting to do in our lives. Let's not be guilty of limiting his work by our unbelief. But let's be open. Let's be honest. Let's look at the record. I challenge you, read the Gospel of John and pray, Lord, if you are real, reveal yourself to me. That's not too much. You could do it in an afternoon, but it could actually determine your destiny eternally is that asking too much when the stakes are so high shall we pray father we marvel at the unbelief here you were there in their midst but they were so mistaken about you they really didn't know. Nor did they take the time to truly discover. And Lord, we see that repeated over and over. Even today, so many who only think they know you, their information is based upon false witnesses Whisperings, lies, gossip. They've ne never looked at the evidence for themselves. And yet, Lord, they've formed opinions that are keeping them from all that you're wanting to do. Your desire to forgive them of their sins. Your desire to adopt them into the family and to make them children of God. your desire to give them your peace, to lavish on them your love. And Lord, 
They're kept from all of these things because of the folly of unbelief. Lord, let them at least look at the facts. Jesus, stir them to study the scriptures that they might indeed come to know you and by knowing have life in your name. This we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.